In this question, we have a solid cube which is placed on a table. The diagram shows all the forces acting on the table and on the tube. And the dot at the start of each, uh, of each force indicates uh, the point at which the force can be considered to act. And the question is asking us to find which of the forces has been drawn in the wrong position. Now, um, just some reminders about the center of gravity. Center of gravity on a symmetrical object is located on the point where the axis of symmetry cross. So in that case, in our cube, we have the example of that where we expect the center of gravity to be on the center since it's a uniform solid. However, we can see that the weight of the cube is not drawn in the center. So therefore, the one that is drawn wrong is the weight of the cube. And just for information, if we had an irregular shape, how do we find the center of gravity for an irregular shape? We just use the suspension method where we suspend the object from different edges. We draw the line of action of the weight in each case. And then where the lines cross each other, this is the the center of gravity. The next question, it has to do with the same, the same case. I'm just, I've just copied the, the diagram there, so easier to access it. So the table has four legs, and then you can see the forces acting from the legs as well. And then we have to find out which of the following statement is correct according to Newton's third law. So just a reminder that the pair of forces that is caused by Newton's third law, the action-reaction, remember that they have to have the same magnitude, the same value, they need to be acting in opposite directions, and the one that students usually uh, get confused is that these two forces, they have to be acting in different objects, they shouldn't be on the same object, and also this pair of forces um, should be of the same type. So when we say type, we mean uh, they need to both, they, they have to be both uh, conduct forces or non-conduct forces and so on. So, uh, from these options, starting, I'm going to start from D, from option D. So, option D is saying, saying that the force, the reaction force of the table on the cube, this one, is equal to the weight of the cube. Now, this is a correct equation in terms of in terms of forces but both of these are acting on the cube so even though it's a correct equation it's not a pair of forces based on Newton's third law because they're acting on the same on the same object so definitely not D then if I look at B um, it re it relates the four forces, four reaction forces of the four legs with the reaction force of the cube on the table, which is that one over there, and the weight of the table. Again, if you look at all the forces acting on the table, that equation is correct because the, the table has a uh, a resultant force of zero and this is fully described by that equation again correct equation but all of these forces are acting on the table so this cannot be um, a pair of newton's third law forces so even though it's a correct equation uh, is not the one we're looking for then um, option a it relates again the four forces from the legs of the table and it says that this is equal to the reaction force of a cube on the table. This is on the table and then is relating the reaction force of the table on the cube. So again, this is, yes, this one involves two objects, but are not, are not really the same. So it's, it, it's actually missing the weight in this case. So this is wrong as well, and therefore the correct answer is C, because it relates the reaction force 
of the cube on the table. So this is on the table. And it says that this is equal to the reaction force of the table on the cube. So the cube is applying this force on the table. And as a reaction, the table is applying that force into the cube. All right. So this follows um, what we said before, same magnitude, opposite direction, different objects, and same type. Then moving on to the next question, you have this electric pump uh, that lifts water from a well through a height of 10 meters at a rate of 4 kilograms per second. The water leaves the pump with a velocity of 5 meters per second, and we need to find an expression that can be used to determine the minimum power output of the pump in watts. So, um, a reminder that the power is the energy per time. So here we can find a relation that gives us the energy that is given by this uh, pump in one second per second, let's say. Now the water starts from there and what does the pump do? Is lifting the, the water up to a height of 10 meters. So the water, when the water is there, it has gained some gravitational potential energy, but also the water um, has some velocity. Therefore, it has some kinetic energy. So the output of the power of the pump, sorry, it should be the sum of these two energies. But since we're looking at power, then we have to consider time to be one second. So what is happening in one second? In every second, the energy that is provided by the pump is given by the sum of potential energy and kinetic energy. So what is gravitational potential? MGH. What is kinetic energy? Half mv squared. Now, the, in one second, you can see here that the mass of the water is 4 kilograms. It is giving us the rate that the water is being lifted. Uh, but this rate is the mass per second. So if we consider this to be one second, that means in every second uh, there's a mass of 4 kilograms. Therefore, if I substitute the numbers, so 4 times 9.81, which is g, times 10, which is the height. So this is the gravitational potential energy. And on that, I'm going to add the kinetic energy of the water, which is, again, half times 4 times 5 square. This is the kinetic energy. So um, then the right answer would be C. All right. So and again, this is supposed to be divided by 1 as time. So we found the energy and we divide the energy per time. So for one second, this is what we have. So imagine that this is also divided by one, but it doesn't make any, any difference in the value. And next one, a student used the falling sphere to determine the acceleration of free fall. The camera produced images of the sphere at constant time intervals as it fell. So the camera is taking um, pictures, it is taking photos at constant time intervals. So that the time difference between each image is the same, the same unit of time. And this image shows the possible positions of the sphere uh, in the first uh, two images. And we are, we've been asked to find out the position of image three. Now, this is a, a free fall. In a free fall, we know that um, it's an accelerating motion. Therefore, the equation that links the displacement and the time is this one. So, this sphere is dropped, so starting velocity is zero, and this is why we haven't used that one 
because that term over here is equal to zero. So this image is actually linking the displacement, which is the distance covered from the beginning, with time because every image is taken in a in a different time in, in, a, in the same time interval, right? So from this equation, you can see that the relation of displacement and time is that the displacement is directly proportional to the square of time. And what does this mean? If time is one unit, let's say, this is also one, because one in the power of two is one. If we have two time intervals, this can be two seconds, it can be two minutes or whatever, but we just use like two, un two units of time. So if t equals two, then the displacement will be four because of the relation and so on. Then if it's three, then if it's nine and, and so on, right? Now we're looking at the third image. So the third image will be on the second time interval. So this is, let's say, t1, right? And after two intervals, it will be from there to the next possible image. So you can see that for two time intervals, we're going to have four uh, units of uh, displacement. So that means that the third image will be in four units of displacement. So therefore, this will be the position. All right. So the time it always starts from zero. Zero is that point over there. So we always measure from the beginning. So therefore, answer is C. And the last multiple choice question of this paper, we have a spring that is compressed with a force F for a distance X. So in the first spring, F equals K times extension over the compression in that case. So this is Hooke's law. Now this is second spring. So that will be spring two of double the stiffness. So that will be 2K, which is compressed by the same distance X. So we can see that KX, which is equal to force one, is that part of the second equation. So these can be F1. Therefore, we can conclude that F2 equals 2 F1. Right. Therefore, B is the right answer.